Well, let's open our Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 7. And we want to look at these first six verses today. And I'm talking about freedom from the law. Now, I stated last week in the message, when a person first comes to Christ, there are some sins that are harder to give up than others. This business of, well, you repent of your sin, then you're going to be sin-free. No, that's not what the Bible says. It never says that. But it means you want to turn from sin. You want to turn to Christ. But some sins, it takes a little while to give up. Well, now, here's the same thing that's also true. There are false teachings that people have been indoctrinated in that sometimes it's hard for them to give up these teachings. And that's what we're saying here. This is why Paul is spending so much time in Romans, why the Holy Spirit is leading him to, to talk about the law in the place of the law of God, the command of God in a believer's life. Because these Jewish people... They had been brought up in a situation where they are taught, you, you need to obey the law. If you want to be pleasing to God, you want to be accepted by God, you must obey the law. Well, the law has its place, and obedience is important. But they had to understand that salvation did not come through them obeying the law. And yet some of them, after they came to faith in Christ, they still held on to this notion well, we, it's Jesus plus I've got to do these things. If I don't do these things, then I'm not going to be in good standing with God. Well, look what he says here in these verses. He's giving them a teaching that was shocking because he's talking to them about being free from the law. Free from the law. That had to be unnerving to these people. And yet it was what they needed to hear for their spiritual well-being. They needed to know what Paul was going to say to them here in these verses. So do we. Uh, we live in this culture, and it's, it's true. Out in life, we need to obey rules. We need to do that. And it helps us if we're obedient. If I'm a student at school, I do a lot better if I'll obey the teacher rather than fight against the teacher. Same thing in sports, same things in music, same things as adults in your business. There are laws to go by within the community. You're better off obeying the laws. But you bring that over into the spiritual realm and you start thinking to yourself, I need to be a good, if I've got to be a good person, if I'm a good person, then that's what God wants of me. And you'll be just as confused as were these Jewish people if you think that. So he's talking about freedom spiritually from the law. Now, look what he says here in these verses. I want to approach this in two ways. First of all, freedom from the jurisdiction of the law. Look in verse 1. He said, Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Now, you read that verse and you think, well, as long as I live, then that means I'm under the jurisdiction of the law until I die physically. And just hold that thought because that's not what he's saying. But he does make this statement. He said, the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as the person lives. And then he does this. He gives an illustration about marriage. He said, for the married woman is bound by law, and that's talking about the law of God, to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, if there's a death, then she is released from the law concerning her husband. She can marry again. But it says in verse 3, so then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. And the same thing is true for a man. If he's joined with another woman while he's married, he'll be called an adulterer. But it says if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Now, I started to just interject here about marriage, but I'm not going to do that today. I'll do that in another message. But I do want to say this, the law of God pertains to marriage, and he does have this law. Jesus said this, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and what God had joined together, let no man put asunder. So that's the law of God. We're not talking here about the laws of society. The laws of society, out here, you can get a divorce. All you have to do is just say we have irreconcilable differences. Bingo, we can get a divorce. Well, not in God's estimation. God makes statements in the Bible about there are some exceptions, two exceptions where people can, if they so choose, get a divorce. 
But under God's law, that is not to happen. They are to stay together, try to work together till death do us part. So he says right here, here's the married woman. She's bound to her husband. But when he dies, when there's a death, now she is free from that law and that sense. Well, let's come back up here to verse 1. So he uses that as an illustration to say to us, we're under the jurisdiction of the law as long as we live. Well, now, what kind of death is he talking about there? Is he talking about our physical death? He is not. He's not. The death he's going to refer to is a spiritual death. And that death takes place when we accept Christ as our Savior. Now look over here in Romans chapter 6 and look in verses 3 through 7. It says this, we've studied this in the past, but he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with him. We died. In order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. So he's talking about our death there. It's a spiritual death. When we come to Christ, my life is crucified. I identify with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I'm turning from my sin. The old self is crucified. It's dead. Now, we still have the body of sin. We're in this body of sin, yes. But there's the death that takes place. And when a person accepts Christ as their personal Savior, then what he's referring to over here in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, then this takes place. The law no longer has jurisdiction over us. The law of God does not. Which means this, that's good news. That means the law cannot be used. The law of God cannot be used to condemn us. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Look in Romans 8, chapter 1. This is what he starts with. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Look over here in Romans chapter 8. Look what it says here in verse 33 and 34. He asks these questions. Who will bring charge against God's elect? God is the one who is justified. He's the one that's declared us not guilty. No one can bring charge against us. Who is the one who condemns Christ Jesus? Is he who died? Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. No one can condemn us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? No one can. Listen, if Satan were able to, if he were able to take the Ten Commandments or other commands that the Lord gives and get before God and take me or take you individually and say, listen, here, they've broken these commands, and so they need to be condemned. Well, the Lord said, well, they won't be because they have been cared for in what I've done on the cross. I've paid for their sins so they do not have to. So when he says we're free from the jurisdiction of the law, that's what it's talking about, and what a relief what a relief for a believer. I am not condemned. I cannot be condemned by the law because Christ has paid for my sin and he has forgiven me totally of all my sins, past, present, and future. Listen, look at it like this. Here, we live in the United States of America, so we're under the jurisdiction of the laws of this land. Now, if we go out here and commit a crime, if I commit a crime, then the authorities are going to be looking for me. And it doesn't matter what color my skin is, whether I'm white, black, red, brown, whatever. I'm under the authority of this country, the laws of this land, the jurisdiction of this country. And so if I break the law, they will come for me. Well, suppose that happens. Suppose I go and break the law. And now the authorities are after me, but I have the means to get out of this country I have somebody that will help me. They'll get me out of this country, and I can get to another country in the world 
that will not extradite me. If that happens, I'm safe in that country. I'm no longer under the jurisdiction of the United States. The United States can't do anything to me because that country that I'm in will not extradite me. Now, if I go to another country that will extradite me, then I'll be in trouble. They can get me. If I come back to the United States, then they can get me. But while I'm in that country, they can't do a thing to me. There was a movie producer, Roman Polanski, years ago, and he committed a terrible act, uh, violated a young lady. Uh, it's terrible. And Polanski, he's a wealthy guy, he fled the country. And he went to another country that would not extradite him, lived there for years. So it was that kind of a setting. Okay, when I just think of this law in this, thing, in this way, think of the law as a country, the country of law. But then think of another country, the country of grace. A person that has not accepted Christ as Savior, they're in the country of the law. They're under the jurisdiction of the law. If they were to have to stand before God, they would be condemned. The law would condemn them. But when this person who is guilty, all of us have lived in the country of the law, and we're all guilty of sin. We've broken the command of God. But when we come and accept Jesus as our Savior, we move from the country of the law to the country of grace. And now you're in Christ Jesus, and when you're in this country, you are safe. You're no longer under this jurisdiction of the law. And the good news about that, you'll never be extradited from that country. Jesus will never give you up, no matter your shortcomings, no matter your failures. Jesus says, I have you in my hand, and no one can pluck you out. Listen, this is wonderful what he's saying here in these passages. But I tell you, people don't understand that. Because here's what's so hard to get across to individuals who are bound up in the law, uh, or bound up in goodness. My goodness is better. They compare themselves to others. And here's the truth. There are some people that have not accepted Christ that they may be living in a better way than some people who have accepted Jesus because some people who have accepted Christ may be in a carnal state. And so this person over here that hasn't accepted Christ may look at them and think, well, I'm better than them. And, th and they very well could be in the way they live their lives. But what they don't realize, they still have sin. And they spend all their time, they say, well, I'm just better than this person. And they just do not realize what has happened in this person's life because they've accepted Christ and what has not happened in their lives because they've not accepted him. You remember the story of the children of Israel while they're in Egypt and they're in bondage for all these years. And uh, the Lord sends Moses to deliver them. And Moses comes and they go through those plagues and then the last plague, they come to the last plague, Pharaoh would not let them go. So Moses told him, here's what's fixing to happen. The death angel is going to come. And the firstborn in all of Egypt is going to die. Well, the Jewish people were told, you put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And when the death angel comes, he'll pass over you. Now, here's what I want you to think. There is no doubt some of the people who lived in Egyptian homes the firstborn of some of them, they weren't all little children. Some of them may be teenagers, may be young adults. But some of the firstborn in Egypt may have lived in a better way than some of the firstborn of the Jewish people. But here's the difference. The death angel comes, even though this person may live better than this person over here. This one dies, and this one is protected because they're covered by the blood. When a person comes to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, yes, we want them to grow in their faith, but even if they're in a state of carnality, some lost person can say, I'm living my life better than them. Well, that doesn't matter because your goodness is not good enough to overcome your sin. You're still under condemnation, whereas the one over here that right now may not be living as good as you are, they're covered by the blood the blood of the Lord Jesus, freed 
from the jurisdiction of the law. Listen, it's a fantastic truth that he gives right here. But now I want you to notice something else he says. Look at another kind of freedom that we experience here. We are free from the incapabilities of the law. Look what it says here in verse 5. It says, while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But while we were in the flesh, now yes, that's talking about an unredeemed person, a person who's not accepted Christ in the flesh. But now we know this to be true. And I've just said it. Even after a person accepts Christ, they can live in a state of carnality. They can be in sin. Hold your place here in Romans chapter 7. Look over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. And here's what he says in these first verses. Paul writes this to the believers at Corinth, and he was dealing with them. They were struggling with this. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, as to men who are growing in their faith, he said, I had to speak to you as men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. You're still just a spiritual babe. He said, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy, there is strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you, are you not mere men? He said, what is Apollos and what is Paul? We're his servants. You're looking up to us like we're something unique. We're not. He we said, we're servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos water. It was God who was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But God, it's God, it's all about him who causes the growth. But he says, you're carnal. You're in a state of carnality. Well, all right, whether it's an unredeemed person, a person who has not accepted Christ, or whether it's a believer who's living in a state of carnality, here's what you need to know. In both cases, obedience to the law cannot bring you deliverance. It cannot. Now, a lost person, as long as they stay without Christ, they don't have any chance. And they may, they may do some good things in their life, but they still have sin, and they will never find deliverance. Now, you think about a believer. Remember in Romans 6, he's stressing to them, you need to do this. You need to make sure that you present the members of your life to the Lord and not to sin. So we make that choice. But if a believer lives in a state of carnality, and yet they think, if I try to do, and, and they can do some of the things that the Bible says I should do, then sooner or later I'll, I'll get out of these sins. And I'm just telling you, you never will. Obedience to the law cannot bring you deliverance from your sin. It cannot. And that's what he's trying to underscore for us here in these verses. Look what he says in this passage in verse 5, how he states this. He says, while we're in the flesh, the sinful passions, which we as believers still have them, they were aroused by the law, and they were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for, a, for death. But these sinful passions, now when you see that aroused by the law, you think, well, the law is bad. Well, that's not what it's saying. It's not the law that causes us to sin. It's the sinful nature that causes us to sin. When it makes this statement, with the sinful passions were aroused by the law, what's that referring to? Well, really, that's talking about our total depravity because here's what that means. And you've experienced this, and I certainly have. When we're told to do something, we must do this. The sinful nature in us will cause us to react in a way that, uh-uh, don't want to. Or when we're told not to do something, well, I think I want to do that. I'm telling you, this goes on every single day. You know how you can see it? Get on the highway. The law of the land, speed limit 70. 
Speed limit 75. If you go 70 or 75, you'll get run over out there. I mean, what is that? Nobody's telling me what to do. These restrictions that the law places, the guidance that God is giving, the sinful nature in us causes us, it just causes it to rear up and say, no, I, that's what I'll do. That's what he's referring to right here. And that's why the law, when it says in this passage of Scripture, it's not saying the law is the one causing us to sin. It's trying to illustrate for us and let us see that the law, even though it tells us what we should do, it has no power to enable us to do it. The law can't. You, you can read the Ten Commandments. You can memorize the Ten Commandments. Look at the commands of Jesus. Memorize them. And if that's the extent of it and you trying on your own, the law will not be able to empower you to do what it says. And I'm telling you, there are a whole lot of believers that do not understand what I've just stated. They don't get that. They're still out here laboring under this notion. I'll, I'll make myself do these things that I'm supposed to do. And maybe they can do it for a little bit and then, boom, they're right back in sin. And they get so frustrated in their life. Well, that's why it's wonderful when he says down here in verse 6, look at this statement. He says, now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He said, listen, you're free from this notion that you have to obey the law. That's a good thing. Because you trying to do it, the law can't help you. But he said, notice we're now in the newness of the Spirit. Here's the big plus about having Christ as your Savior. When you give your life to Jesus, now something dramatically has changed because Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is living in you, and he is the only one who can give you the ability to do what God wants you to do. You can't. The law can't. The Spirit of God can. He can empower you and strengthen you to live the life Christ wants you to live. That's the only way you can live it. The only way you can live it. You don't come to a point where you surrender daily to the Spirit of God. You'll never have victory over the sin in your life. And that's what he's trying to underscore here. Now, look how this is unveiled. Look, Paul just talks about his own life. And I made reference here in a past message. Some people, when they get over here, when I did that overview, that message, I wanted to do that because some people read these verses in Romans 7 and say, well, this is talking about Paul when he was lost. No, it's not. In, in Romans 3 through 5, those chapters, that's where he's talking about people being justified. When you get to 6 to 8, he's talking about people who are believers being sanctified, being made like Christ. In those other verses, he has stated the law of God cannot justify you. You trying to obey it, it can't. Now, in these verses, he's trying to say the law of God, you trying to obey it, cannot result in your sanctification. It can't result in you being more like Christ. And he gives his own life as an example. Look at these verses. Verse 14. He said, we know that the law is spiritual. And it is. It's good. The law is good. But he said, I am a flesh. I'm sold into bondage to sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. And while I'm reading this, see if this is your life. Maybe your life right now. He says, for I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. How peculiar is that? Who do something that they hate? Well, he did. And haven't you? You get involved in some sin, you at first think it's going to be so pleasurable, and then you just beat yourself and think, why did I do this? How stupid. And you hate, hate this? That's what he's saying. He said, if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me. I want to do good, 
but the doing of good is not. I want to, but I'm not doing it. It then says this, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not want. If I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin, which dwells in me. He said, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. And I'm glad Paul was honest enough about his own life to admit, yes, there's evil in me. Can you say that about your life? It's true, whether you want to say it or not. Then look what he says, verse 22, I joyfully concur with the law of God. I agree with it. In the inner man, I agree with this. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from this body of death? Now look at him. He said, the law of God is good. He said, I concur with the law of God. I agree with the law of God. I want to abide by this, but I can't do it. So what's he saying to us? He's saying the law of God could not give me deliverance from my sin. My knowledge of God's law, my desire to want to do it, could not give me deliverance from my sin. He said, I'm such a wretch just a wretch who will deliver me from this body of death the law couldn't and he says this verse 25 and he didn't come to this in a split second it took him a while but he did come to this thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord he said on the one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God but on the other hand with my flesh the law of sin but he said deliverance comes through Christ Jesus Listen, that's what we've got to understand. It's through the Spirit of God that Jesus gives. Remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane and he's praying, he asked Peter, James, and John to pray, and they fell asleep. So he comes out and he sees him. He said, couldn't you keep watching just for, for an hour? And then he said to them, he said, you need to keep watching and praying because the Spirit is willing. Jesus said, I know your Spirit. It's willing. But he said, I also know this, the flesh is weak. So you better be praying. You better be looking for divine strength. You know, living the Christian life is like witnessing for Christ. Remember what Jesus told them right before he ascended into heaven? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, he told them. He didn't say, I'm leaving now. Get out of here. Go start witnessing. No, he said, I want you to wait right here. You just wait. And the promise is going to come. And he quoted what John the Baptist said. He said, "I'm one's coming that's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And he said, that promise is going to be fulfilled shortly. But you wait right here until it happens. And then he says in verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. And then you shall go and be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. But he said, you wait here for the Spirit to come because you can go out here and do all the witnessing you want to, but if you're not going in the power of the Spirit, it's just wasted breath. He said, you wait for the Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will empower your witness. He will make things spiritually happen. When I listen, the same thing's true in living the Christian life. You and I have better learn, I must rely on the Holy Spirit of God. Thank thank the Lord for these verses here in Romans where he says you are free not only from the jurisdiction of the law, the law can no longer condemn you. You are free from the incapabilities of the law. The law cannot empower you to live the Christ-like life. Only the Holy Spirit of God can do that. That's why Paul, Paul makes this statement in Galatians 2.20. Galatians, such a great book, he said, I'm crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I'm living, I'm living according to the law. I'm, no, he didn't. He says, I'm living by faith, by trust in the Lord Jesus. I'm trusting him. And why I also said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, he just made a simple statement. He said, if you walk with the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That's the only means of victory, the Holy Spirit. 
So listen, take these words to heart that Paul is giving. These are some of the greatest teachings to me in the Bible, what he's saying to us about how to live the kind of life that Christ wants us to live. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Now, there could be people sitting right here in this room and certainly people viewing this that uh, maybe this is spoken right to you because maybe you're one of these people. That possibly you've accepted Jesus, but you're, you've been doing your dead level best. I'm trying. I want to do the things that God tells me to do. But you're trying to do that on your own effort and just the fact you know what the law says. And I know you have to be frustrated because that doesn't work. And if you're in that situation, I would just ask you, would you be willing to just in this moment just to say, Lord Jesus, help me this truth that I've heard this day. Help me to be at this place where I'm going daily to trust you and no one else. I have no ability, no strength within myself, but your spirit who lives in me can empower me. And so, Spirit of God, I want to rely on you. I want to depend on you. I want to walk the walk of faith. I want to walk in your spirit. Would you just say that to me? And maybe you're someone and you're one of the individuals that you've never trusted in Christ, but you do. You look at other people who say they're believers. You think, well, I'm better than them. Listen to me. That doesn't matter. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, you've still sinned. I don't care what good deeds you have in your life. And nothing has been done for your sin if you haven't trusted in Christ. If you want forgiveness and healing and help, you've got to come to the cross. You've got to come and ask Jesus to be your Savior. If you need to make that commitment, would you do that? Lord Jesus, I need you. Father, I just pray that uh, however we need you to work in our lives, whether it's a believer or a non-believer, Lord Jesus, I pray with your spirit that you would. Lord, thank you. Jesus, you liberate us. I pray every believer can know the truth. We're not condemned, no longer under condemnation. But Lord Jesus helps us also understand, if I want to walk in victory, I've got to walk relying on you, depending on you. Lord, any commitment that a person needs to make, I pray you'd help them to make it this day. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed, in just a moment we'll be dismissed. If you need to talk, I'm right here at the front. I'd love to visit with you if you'd like to accept Jesus as your Savior or maybe there's a prayer need you have in your life or a struggle in your life. I'd be glad to talk with you. If you're watching this by live stream, if we can help you, all you have to do is contact us. The number and the website are there before you. I thank you so much for viewing today, and I thank all of you for being in here. God bless you for coming. Hope you have a great time. And you community groups, Sunday school classes, Bible study, whatever you want to call them. It's a great time of fellowship and Bible study follows right now. If you don't have a class, Jay Raymer's right here. He can help you find one. Come see him, please. God bless you. Thanks for being here.